let's do factoring of quadratic functions. Look at that. So let me give you a little intro. And by the way, if there's math questions, let us know. We'll make a little list here that we're going to go over. But right now, we're going to talk about factoring. Fenetra. <laughs> we're going to talk about factoring quadratics. Factoring quadratics. Let me give you a little intro. Factoring quadratics, this thing right here, right? And quadratics are parabolas. When they say quadratics in general, this is what we're talking about, right? Something that does this, right? So if you throw a pen, it'll do this, right? So this stuff comes in handy in economics, comes in handy in kinematics, comes in handy multiple different places, right? I always say that Japanese is in many, many ways easier to learn than French. I've never tried. Okay. So factoring, the reason if you're looking at have been popping onto the math streams or if you talk to people who try to learn mathematics and whatnot, usually one of the places that people have a hard time with, there's a few different places that takes people out of the game, right? One of the places that takes people out of the game is factoring quadratics because this is really the first time you're introduced to the concept of factoring. Factoring. So it's not factoring quadratics that takes people out of the game. It's factoring that takes people out of the game. The reason that most people are taken out of the game when they encounter encounter factoring quadratics is because they don't understand what factoring really is because it's never really explained properly right or let me paraphrase that right or say it in a way that's not condescending <laughs> i found with students that i work with once they understand what factoring is then they don't have a hard time factoring quadratics because quadratics are just parabolas right so what is factoring? Factoring is us looking at a system and breaking it down to its core properties, right? Factoring can be thought of as the same process as factoring an integer, okay, or a natural number, right? And if someone's doing factoring quadratics, they've already encountered prime numbers, factoring natural numbers right so consider this consider the number 28 okay 28 now one of the things that happens is when you're coming into high school or whatnot or you're looking at the real number set what you find out is this is called a composite number it's not a prime number and prime numbers are numbers that can only be divided evenly by one in themselves right so 28 is made up of other numbers Okay, so what you can do is break down 28. So take 28 and break it down into things that multiply together to give you 28. If the number is even, you can always divide it by 2. So you're going to take 28, divide it by 2. 2 times 14 gives you 28, right? And this is multiplication between these, but we never put it in because we know it's multiplication. We're talking about multiplication. Now, 2 is a prime number. It can only be broken down into one and itself multiplied together to give us two. So anything that fits that pattern that can only be broken down into one times itself to give itself, then we don't break it down. But 14 is two times seven, right? So we break this down two times seven. Cool, right? So what we find out is 28, 28, is really 2 times 2 times 7. Okay. Cool. Useful? Damn right it's useful. It's very, very useful. It's on the same concept of us taking something in the natural world, right, and breaking it down to find out what its building blocks are, right? For example, take water. Okay. Water. <laughs> so take water. 
Mask of a Raven. Let's check it out. When I first explained to one of my friends the actual purpose of going from, for example, that to that, rather than just a trick, he'd learn, he found it very illuminating. Very illuminating indeed. Indeed. Right? So on the same concept of this number, right? Take water. What's water? Water is H2O, right? H two O. Right? Now, back in the day, us human beings, before we understood what molecules, atoms, during the time where we thought everything in the world was made up of five elements: earth, wind, fire, water, and wood or soil i don't know what it was right but one of them has always been water during that period we looked at water and went that's water we thought water was just water nothing made up water water was the thing right and then as we evolved as we understood more about the world we realized that water is really pure water is really h2o cool what is h2o break down h2o H2O says there is H2, two hydrogens, and an oxygen. Cool, right? And two hydrogens means hydrogen and a hydrogen. Cool. What's water? It's two hydrogens and an oxygen. Cool. Why is this important? Well, what else can you make with this building block, right? Because if your building block, your core building block is H2O, you have to make whatever you make has to have h2o in it but if you're able to break this down into its prime factors right prime elements then you can take parts of these and create something else right you could take a 2 from 28 and a 7 from 28 2 times 7 is 14 and multiply it by 5 what do you come up with hmm, cool 0 2 you come up with 70. Oh, that means if we break down 70, it's 7 times 10. 10 is 2 times 5. So it's 2 times 7 times 5. 2 times 7 times... Cool, we just came up with a new number, right? Guess what? We do the same thing with these things, right? Guess what? We do the same thing with functions, right? So on the same concept, We can take any function and try to break it down into core building blocks, right? Let's start off with one of the easy functions. Let's start off with the quadratic. So it's breaking down the thing called factoring. That's exactly what it's called, void, right? Breaking down the thing is called factoring. It's called breaking it down to see what its core building blocks are, right? That's it. And a quadratic is just a function that's a parabola that does this. Guess what? We have an infinite number, infinite types of functions. Here's a quadratic. A cubic does this. Power 4 does this. Power 5 can do that. You can have a line. This guy is really one of the core functions we have right you could have a function that does this right there are an infinite number types of functions we have and what we can do is we can factor all of them or we can try to factor all of them and a line is usually considered to be the prime factor the prime function of a lot of these functions okay so the way we get into factoring for us the first thing we factor try to factor is a quadratic because a quadratic is a parabola and a parabola is really two lines multiplied together right so in my part of the world they teach you lines in grade nine if you're lucky not really they don't teach you that if you're lucky you get a good teacher they teach you that in grade nine but usually in grade 10 they encounter this in my part of the world in other parts of the world you probably do this in grade five right 
some parts of the world you don't even get a chance to do this right straight line is called a linear function right exactly why is this called a linear function or the way you can remember is called a linear function i don't know why it is but it's called a linear function because it's a line right so consider linear functions to be your prime numbers if you were breaking down natural numbers right so first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at a quadratic right so let's take a look at a quadratic. Let's take an example of a quadratic function. Now, if you've been here, you know there's one quadratic function I like, right? Over the real number, there are polynomial factors of any degree. For example, uh, x squared, x plus one cannot be factored and acts as a sort of a polynomial prime exactly yeah right we get into that later down the road <laughs> right it doesn't necessarily have to be a line sometimes you can't break things down any further right and those become your prime functions right it's not as it's not as simple as prime numbers prime functions right so take a look at this let's take a quadratic let's take this quadratic I'm going to use f of x. If this is freaking people out, think of this as y, because that's all it is, right? So if you want, we can just write it as y. Okay. y is equal to x squared plus 5x plus 6. Okay. So let's assume you're given this polynomial function, right? The polynomial is just a smooth function. Quadratics is one of the core base polynomial functions, right? So let's assume you're given this quadratic function. And it's a quadratic because this thing graphs a parabola. We talked about We can talk about it further, right? Try to graph it and stuff. And we've done a lot of this quadratic, graphing quadratic functions. If you look up Chicho completing the square, you'll see us graphing these guys. But right now, let's assume we were given this function and this function explain some system in our world right and we wanted to break it down we want to find out if there are any prime functions within this function right what's this thing made from right and this is called a simple trinomial right so what you do with simple trinomials because there's no there's only a one in front of the x squared you look for two numbers that multiply to give you six and add to give you five yeah, in the complex numbers, every polynomial is fully factor, factorable, factorizable into linear factors. Awesome. I got to look further into this, man, right? So we're tr if we're trying to factor this quadratic, simple quadratic function, simple trinomial, we look for two numbers that multiply to give you 6, multiply to give you 6, whoop, and add to give you five add to give you five okay and always remember the sign in front of the number goes with the number right so this is positive six and this is positive five okay always start off with the multiplication part because there's less integers there's a finite number of integers that can multiply to give you this number then add to give you this number okay or yeah integers so there's a finite number of numbers integers that can multiply to give you that but there's an infinite number of integers that can multiply to give you the middle number or add to give you the middle number so don't start off with the middle number start off with this number list all the numbers that multiply to give you six we got one times six negative one times negative six two times three negative 2 times negative 3, right? 1 times 6, 6. Negative 1 times negative 6, 6. 2 times 3, 6. Negative 2 times negative 3, 6, right? So what you do now is, hopefully this is coming out okay for you guys. Now what you do is add these two numbers. 1 plus 6 is 7, so that doesn't work. Negative 1 plus negative 6 is negative 7, so that doesn't work. 
2 plus 3 is 5. That works. Let's check to make sure the next number is not going to work, right? Or what it's going to equal. Negative 2 plus negative 3 is negative 5. We're looking for positive 5, so that's not going to work. So the two numbers that multiply to give you 6 add to give you 5 or 2 and 3, right? Yeah, I know 2 and 3, or 3 and 2. So all you do for this is you go, oh, this guy you can break down into x, x, plus 2, plus 3. Right? So this broken down into its prime factors is this guy times this guy. That's cool. Right? These are lines, linear functions, each one of these. Right? So if we call y1 is equal to x squared plus 5x plus 6, let's give this guy a name. Let's call this w. Let's give this guy a name. Let's call this z. So y is really w times z. Now you don't have to go there. I'm just doing this for visualization. And what's w? w is x plus 2. z is x plus 3. Right? We're just using substitution basically. God, I miss being taught something fascinating. <laughs> nice. Right? So, y, this is what we found out so far. Y can break down into w times z. You can think of these as different elements. Right? I miss mathematics. <laughs> I'm so glad math is part of my life. Really. As, as someone who has been. His life has been revolved around mathematics for the last couple of decades at least, right? Oh man, I couldn't imagine my life without mathematics. It's, it, 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 it's good for the processing system, really. It is amazing BS detector. It's fantastic to meditate to. It's fun to play with. It improves your abilities to do whatever you want to do in life. It gives you better understanding of the world. <laughs> like. It's win, 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 right? Dang, Po, how are you doing? I know, yeah, it's amazing, right? So consider Y. We took Y, and for us right now, Y was this function, but it could be H2O, it could be water, it could be a number, it could be another compound we're breaking down. We broke Y down into a W and a Z. Wow, Y is made up of W and Z. W, what's W? W is X plus 2, and Z is X plus 3, right? I'm going to do a little cleaning house, and what we're going to do is we're going to graph this. Okay, howdy chat. Amigos, Niolo. <laughs> right? So let's break this down. I'm going to erase these guys. We're going to need more space, right? So let's break this down or erase this and write down the core stuff that we know we found out about this. We found out that this thing is x plus 2 and x plus 3, right? Is that big enough for you? Oh, yeah, it's big enough for you guys to see, right? And what did we say? We said x plus 2. We called w is equal to x plus 2. And we said let z equal x plus 3. That's a linear function. That's a linear function. A line and a line, right? So let's graph both of these lines. Okay. Now I'm going to assume you know how to graph a line. Voyager 2, how are you doing? This is the x-axis, that's the y-axis, right? Now, you know what? Let's graph it using a table of values for this one, and then we're going to straight up graph it there if you know y equals mx plus b, right? Let's use a table of values for this. Now, this guy, this axis, right now we're going to graph w, and then we're going to graph z, and then we're going to graph y, okay? So... If we're using a table of values to graph this, x 
and w. Okay. Just plug in numbers for x and find out what w is. So the first number, usually easy number to deal with, you can plug in 0 for x. If you plug in 0 for x, this becomes 0 plus 2, which is 2. If you plug in 1 for x, uh, for x you're going to find out this is 3. Let's grab 1. We've got 1 here. We've got 1 here. Let's grab 1 on this side. Negative 1. Negative 1 plus 2 is 1. And if you have negative 2, negative 2 plus 2 is 0, right? Let's plot these points on the graph, right? 0 and 2. 1, 2. 1 and 3. 1, 1, 2, 3. 1 and 3. Negative 1 and 1. Negative 1 and 1. And negative 2 and 0. Negative 2 and 0, right? Okay. So this line, W, looks like this. This is the line W. Okay. Let's graph this guy. Okay. I'm going to erase our table of values here. Okay. If we're going to graph here, let's circle this so we know what we're graphing. That's W. Here's Z, right? So let's graph Z. If we're graphing this, we can use the function form notation y is equal to mx plus b where b is your y-intercept m is your slope so if you know how to read this and it's a sentence by the way mathematics all of the stuff that we write down they're sentences they're saying something they're telling us something so z is equal to x plus three that's the y-intercept and the slope is one over one so here's the y-intercept and you go up one over one which is the same slope as this guy, so you can make a line that's, oops, let me make a, oh my god. Here is Z, okay, the line Z. So we have two lines, right? This guy's W, and that guy's Z. Okay, cool. Now, this is what this factor tells us, right? If you notice this, we have this guy times this guy, which is W times Z, right? Which means if we take W, this line, and multiply it by this line, we get that guy. And the graph of that guy, let's graph it. Should I use a different color? Let's use a different color. <laughs> this is cool. Let's use this color. So we're going to graph this. Okay. The graph of this guy, and this is negative 3 here for that guy, is going to go through here. Here, let's graph it using a better color. Let's graph it using brown. How did you get the slope? The slope here, here, let me do a little aside. Fill in the blanks. So equation of a line is y is equal to mx plus b. b is your y-intercept, and m is your slope. Right? And slope is rise over run. Right? Rise over run. Okay. For this function, we had z is equal to x plus 3. If there's no number in front of a variable is just one, right? So this is one, and we could always make a fraction out of any number by putting it over one. So one over one. So the y-intercept for this is y int is equal to three, which is here, and the slope, slope, which is m, is one over one. So we went up one over one. Okay. Does that make sense? I hope so. Let's graph this using brown. Okay. Logical. I love it. Nice. Cool. Yes, good description. Okay. Now take a look at this. We're going to graph this guy. Now, should we kick it up one more? Let's kick it up one more level complexity so you see really what's going on, right? 
I'm going to erase these guys. Well, let me paraphrase. We're not going to kick it up one level complexity. We're going to give it a little bit more explanation as to why certain things are the way they are. Right? Now, I have a video out there. Let me get you this video. Okay? And it's called uh, The Power of Zero. Chicho. Power. Oops. Power of Zero. Uh, we've done a couple of these, but uh, here, I'll give you this one. Take a look at this video. Okay. If for reference, anyway. Okay. Now, in this video, I'm about to let you know what it is that we're doing. Okay. In this video, what the meat of that video is, and we're gonna. It's gonna take us like. A minute to explain it right now zero in mathematics gives us problems we can't divide by zero if we divide by zero the universe explodes right but zero also provides us solutions okay here's a question for you let's say we have a times B times C times D equaling zero how can you multiply four things to equal zero what can you deduce? What can you conclude about A, B, C, and or D, right? At least one needs to be zero, right? At least one of them needs to be zero. Very important. Or all could be zero. Yeah, all could be zero as well, for sure, right? But at least one of them has to be zero. That's not the case if this was two right or any other number than zero if this was two you couldn't say at least one of them has to be two that's not correct the combination of a b c and d multiplying together to give you two is infinite right the possibilities are infinite okay however as soon as we set this equal to zero then at least one of them has to be zero Wow, we just took it infinite, something that was infinite, and reduce it down to at least one of them has to be zero. <laughs> powerful, 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 right? Incredible. Cool. Well, how does this apply here? Well, take a look at this. Right now, we have y is equal to x plus 2 times x plus 3 right huh now let me ask you this this is a function that plots on an x y axis right on an x y grid right so ask yourself this when does this function cross the x axis when is this function going to cross the x-axis? Just the same way you could ask this. When does this function cross the uh, x-axis? And when does this function cross the x-axis, right? Well, this function, w, crosses the x-axis when w is 0. Because w is this. This line is both r, or it's y, w, and z. When x, not when x is negative, but when x is zero, uh, when, yeah, when x is negative for these ones, my apologies, right? But not just any negative, it has to be a certain negative, negative two. So if you want to find out when this crosses the x-axis, you just set w equal to zero, because this is w equals one, two, three, negative one, negative two. So this has to be zero, right? That's our scale. So all you do is just set w equal to 0. This becomes x plus 2. Bring the 2 over. So x equals negative 2. That's what it is. That's where we are, negative 2. Let me use the right colors for this. So this is negative 2. And this guy here, if you do it for this one, set z equal to 0. Bring 3 over. That's negative 3. Right? Cool. 
what's my math background? Um, I got my degree in geophysics and a minor in mathematics. And I've been teaching math for like 20 years plus high school mathematics only. Right? It's not very high. I just know how to teach high school math. Right. Now, what about this function? Well, we haven't graphed this function yet, right? But we can ask ourselves, oh, okay, just curious. No worries, Bacon. Bacon slaying. Welcome to our live stream, by the way. So we have this function, y is equal to x plus 2 times x plus 3. So we haven't graphed this function yet. But let's ask ourselves, when does this function cross the x-axis? Well, this function crosses the x-axis when y is equal to 0. So let's set y is equal to 0. Let's take this guy, x is equal to, or sorry, y is equal to x plus 2 times x plus 3. So we're going to set y is equal to 0, right? When y is 0, we're on the x-axis. So we're asking ourselves, when does this function cross the x-axis? Well, we take this and link it up with here. We have two things multiplied together to give us zero. How is that possible? The only way that's possible is if one of them is equal to zero. Okay, so you set each one equal to zero. So you can say, oh, this is true only. This function crosses the x-axis only when either this x plus 2 is equal to zero or x plus 3 is equal to zero. That means x is equal to negative 2 and x is equal to negative 3. Oh, wow, cool. It's at the same place. Oh, nice. So this function, this function crosses the graph here and here. We don't know how it looks aside from that, but we know that it crosses the x-axis here and here. Okay. Very cool. Very cool, right? Now, we can graph this using complete square, but I don't want to do that, right? I want to show you another way you can look at this whole thing. This will blow you away a little bit too, right? Or it should solidify your understanding of this concept. Take a look at this. Let's create a table, right? And by the way, this graph, let me give you a function. Do you have uh, permutations and combinations in high school? We do. Uh, I'm not very good at it with permutations and combinations uh, because they play word games with people, right? Uh, factoring. Let me see if I can find it with one. There it is. Here's, here's a video. It's called Factoring Polynomials, a Graphical Representation, Why We Factor. And I put this video out. This is part of the Language of Mathematics series, and I put this video out in 2010, almost 10 years ago. Cool, right? Nine and a half years ago. And this is the function that we talked about. It's an eight minute video that'll graphs it for you as well, right? But I'm gonna show you a table format of how you can take a look at this. Appreciate what's going on here, right? Now take a look at this. <laughs> You're like, wow, 2010. And that was me at a skate park with my tripod and people skateboarding around me and me doing mathematics on the walls, right? You were ahead of time. I just did what I did, right? Now take a look at this. Let's create a table. X, X, Y, actually X, W, Z, and Y, right? X, W, Z and Y. Okay. This is W, that's Z, that's Y, and our X appears in all of them, right? It's the independent variable that both, or all three of them, W, Z, and Y are dependent on, right? So X is our independent variable, and W, Z, and y are dependent on x, right? So let's find out what w, z, and y are for certain values of x. Cool? Cool. 
Let's plug in x is equal to 0. What's w when x is equal to 0? You put 0 in for x. So w is equal to 2. z, if you put in 0 for x, z is equal to, because this disappears, z is equal to 3. If you put in 0 for x here, this becomes 2, that becomes 3, 2 times 3 is 6. Right? Do you see what's going on? Let's do another number. Let's plug in x is equal to 2. Okay. Should we do 2? Yeah, let's do 2. Uh, let's do 1 first, so we don't go too far. Oh my god, it makes so much sense. What <laughs> sense? Oh, wow, nice. <laughs> so take a look at this. Let's put in x is equal to 1. 1. Plug in 1 here. 1 plus 2 is 3. So w becomes 3. Put in 1 here. 1 plus 3 is 4. Right? What's y? Put in 1 here. 1 plus 2 is 3. 1 plus 3 is 4. 3 times 4 is 12. Wait a second. Wait a second. Exactly, Anuj. Why? It's just these two multiplied together. What? What? Right? Let's put in x is equal to negative negative let's make it num easy for us to multiply <laughs> i don't know what that says let's put in negative eight negative eight when x is negative eight negative eight plus two is negative six negative eight plus three oh, ne bro negative eight plus three is negative five Negative 6, well, if you put in, you could put in negative 8 here if you want, but we don't have to anymore. We could just multiply these two. Negative 6 times negative 5 is 30. That's what y is. Wow, cool. 30. <laughs> I think. Negative 6 times negative 5, 30, right? I don't know if my voice is up. So check this out. When x is 0, w is 2 z is 3, y is 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, when z is 1, oh sorry, when x is 1, are you steady? We're doing, we're just doing math, learning math, practicing math, meditating, right? When x is 1, w is 3, when x is 1, w is 3, well, it was, we knew that. Z is 4, well, we knew that. Y is 12, oh man. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. <laughs> I've been out of contact with any school subjects for nine years now. <laughs> no, you're not, man. You're not. It'll take you two seconds to get this back. The cool thing is, I don't know what I teach you. Hello, QC warrior. How are you doing? How is life? Right? Negative 8. Negative 8. We're not even on the board. Negative 4, negative 5, negative 6, negative 7, negative 8. When x is negative 8, w is negative 6, right down here. z is negative 5, like down here, if you extend this. And y is 30. Right? What does the graph of this look like? this parabola look like? This stream is about mathematics. It's easy to review math unlike some other subjects. Yeah, math should be the easiest course you take in high school, period. University, different game. High school should be the easiest course you take because it just builds from previous years, right? 30 is definitely out of the whiteboard. I think so there, <laughs> right? If we end up graphing this function, this is what it's going to look like. Take a look. That's what it looks like. Let me make this darker so it comes out. My pens are running out. I need to go to 
the stationery store. We need to go get ourselves more stationery. <laughs> Having a little break from steady, pun intended, and I saw you were live, so thought I would take my little break here. Awesome QC warrior. I'm glad. <laughs> it's a nice place to show. Tu, tu et tu vois. Tu et tu vois. All right. So that's the function. Now here's the kicker. To me, this is the kicker, right? People don't realize, but this graph stuff is really important. Engineering stuff, huge, humongous. It's crazy important in economics as well. Crazy important everywhere, right? Crazy important everywhere. And here's the kicker. We took two lines, right? Let me set two lines, multiply them together, and we got a curve. Why is that? We got a curve because of the property of mathematics, where if you multiply two negatives, you get a positive, right? Even in economics, right? So if you multiply two negatives, you get a positive. Now take a look at this. Now I talk about this in the the short video, the th the eight minute video that I linked up previously, right? When we're breaking the sucker down, okay? But think of it this way: the zero point, the factoring. When you're factoring, you're finding where functions cross the x-axis. That's what it is. Long story, right? Why do we factor? We're factoring. To find where functions crosses the x crosses cross the x-axis, right? In the most simplistic form. Sometimes you're factoring to find out when functions cross each other, right? And these linear lines have endless possibilities, right? And they go on forever. Yeah. Unless we give it boundaries, limits, right? That make sense according to our systems. Okay. But take a look at this. Let's assume. Oh, this is going to be red. This might not come out well. I'm going to try green. Let's try green. So the x-axis is sort of a important point, right? So take a look at this point. Let's extend this up. And let's extend this up. This is basically the line x is equal to negative 2, and this is well, x is equal to negative 3. If you look at these functions, all three functions, W on this side of negative 2, x is equal to negative 2, is positive because it's above the x-axis. What Z is positive because it's above the x-axis, right? So positive times a positive gives us a positive. So we're above the x-axis, right? If you look at this zone, from negative 2 to negative 3, W is below the x-axis, so it's negative. Z is above the x-axis in this zone. Z above is above the x-axis, so it's positive. Negative times a positive is negative. That's why negative times a positive is negative. That's why our function, y, is below the x-axis. right? And then as you get closer to negative 3, this number gets smaller. So it's kicking up this y value. And then once you go to this side of negative 3, when x is negative 3, both the z and w are below the x-axis, so they're both negative. And negative times a negative is positive. Positive. So when you're multiplying two linear functions, when they go below the x-axis, there are two negatives multiplying each other to become a positive if you're talking about quadratic. So our function y has to start coming back up again. It has no choice. That's its behavior, right? Cool? 